Good day, beautiful people, and welcome back to Life Treasures and Golden Moments. This is Natalie Silva, and I share with you today two stories of miracles and stories of inspiration. I'd like to start off today's uh, podcast with a, a story, The Colors of Prejudice, and the, it was authored by M.A. Kozak. Carol glanced at her watch as she pulled into the school parking lot and sighed with relief. It was 2.25 p.m. Thomas got out of school at 2.30. She'd be waiting at the curbside pickup spot when the dismissal bell rang. If Carol wasn't there when her son walked out of school, he would panic. Once, when she'd been 10 minutes late, she found him waiting for her in tears. Carol credited Thomas's insecurity to his having been abandoned by his birth mother in his native Mexico. Carol and her husband, George, had adopted Thomas when he was three. Carol sat in the car at the curb, listening to an old, old oldie station, and smiling and knowing Thomas would change the radio to a jamming station as soon as he hopped into the car. She spotted him leaving the building, and from the troubled look on his face, she could tell that there was something wrong. Trailing behind Thomas was a group of boys. One of them shouted something at her son, but Carol couldn't hear what he said. As soon as Thomas spotted his mom, he bolted from the group and jumped into the car. Locking the door, Thomas shouted, Get going, Mom, now! As Carol pulled away from the curb, he rolled down the car window and yelled, Go to hell! And he used a racial slur. No, Thomas, stop that! Don't ever say that! I can't believe you said that, Carol shouted. Too angry to speak calmly, she drove the rest of the way home in silence. She wondered where he'd heard such a vile word. She wondered what she could say or do to make him understand how wrong it was to say such ugly words. When Carol parked the car, Thomas reached for the door handle. Wait a minute, Thomas. When we go in, I want you to go to your room and think about what you just said and what had happened. They got out of the car and walked to the house. As Carol turned the key in the front door, Thomas blurted out, you don't know what it's like going to school with them. I don't want to go to that school anymore. You are not changing schools. Dad and I picked that school because we want you to go to school with children of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, she said, opening the door. Now go to your room. Carol walked into the kitchen, and a flood of childhood memories engulfed her. She remembered the countless times her father and uncle had sat around the dining room table, drinking beer, cursing, and slinging racial slurs. Her stomach churned, and she trembled, remembering the hate that had filled her childhood home. Carol knew the ignorance, fear, racism, hate, and violence all went hand in hand, and that racism is often passed along from one generation to another. She vowed as a girl that it would stop with her. She couldn't let it infect her son. Carol also believed that anger begat anger and violence begat violence. She was determined to teach her son another way of coping with differences and conflicts. Though she was still upset about his behavior and the horrid memories it had conjured up in her inside her, Carol forced herself to calm down. She needed to think clearly and find a rational way to deal with this. Carol poured a glass of milk and placed a few cookies on a paper plate. She picked up a notepad and some markers from the desk and brought them to the kitchen table. Thomas, please come into the kitchen, she called. When Thomas walked into the room, he saw his mom sketching something on the notepad. Sit down. Thomas, we need to talk, she said. Please tell me what happened today. Those black kids at school are always pushing everybody around. One kid said he was going to kick my ass after school today, for no reason. If you weren't there, he would have done it, too. There's no reason for you to use racial slurs. But, 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 Mom, no but, young man. You cannot and will not say those kinds of words to anyone, ever, and I mean it. Carol paused, using silence to reinforce the gravity of her words. Calling people names doesn't solve anything. Being hateful to someone who's been hateful to you just builds more hate. Remember the golden rule? Yeah, I guess. Hate leads to violence, and then people get hurt or even killed. 
Placing the picture she'd drawn in front of her son, Carol asked, What is this? Thomas looked at the rectangular box with three colored circles. A traffic light. Yes, but they're also the colors of prejudice. Well, shouldn't they be black and white? Thomas, as you get older, you'll learn that nothing is black and white. Also, there are many more colors of people than black and white, she said. But how come they're the colors of prejudice? Well, red is the color of hate and anger. Amber is the color of caution and fear. And green is the color of envy and jealousy. I don't understand, Mom. Carol searched for a way to put it into perspective. I was about your age during the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. There were marches, fights between blacks and whites, and riots. Some of my relatives hated blacks and Jews, and their anger and hate scared me. But I also remember being afraid of black for no reason. When I was little, she went on, my dad and uncles were good people in my eyes. They never hurt anyone or broke any laws. At family gatherings, they would talk about why they hated blacks and Jews and said nasty things about them. I didn't understand, and it made me feel scared and bad inside. But I didn't question it because they were the grown-ups. Well, why did they hate black people? I think because they thought black people were very different from them. They looked and talked differently. They had different customs and mannerisms. And they made my dad and uncles afraid. She gave Thomas a moment to assert what she had just said. I think my family was also envious of the Jews because some of the Jewish people in our town, through hard work and ambition, had become very well educated and wealthy. My family's jealousy made them feel inferior and that made them feel threatened. Thomas looked at his mother intensely, trying to decode all what what she was saying. Are you saying Grandpa was a racist? No, I'm saying that Grandpa and many other people were confused and scared and jealous, and they let those feelings turn into anger and hate. I believe prejudice is fear, and envy camouflaged as anger. And I believe fear and envy come from ignorance, from not really knowing or understanding the other person. Well, how come you didn't turn out like Grandpa? Well, when I was about 13, something happened that made me think about all these things. You know, my family is Catholic, and I went to Catholic grade school, right? Uh Uh-huh. Well, when I was in seventh grade, I transferred to a public school where I met my best friend, Gail. Gail's family was Protestant, and one day I went with Gail to her aunt's house. Everyone was sitting around the table, drinking beer and saying bad things about Catholics. One of the things I remember them saying was, a pregnant woman would be crazy to have a baby at a Catholic hospital. Why would they say that? Well, years ago, if there was trouble when a baby was born, doctors in Catholic hospitals would make sure the baby was taken care of first, and sometimes the mother died because of it. Gail's relatives were angry about that. They had lots of other mean things to say about Catholics, too. It really upset me. Did you tell them to shut up? No, I just listened. When I got home, I told Grandpa what happened. He told me Gail's relatives were just ignorant and that I shouldn't pay any attention to what they said. But, Dad, they talk about Catholics like you talk about Negroes. Until then, I had never said that word. Grandpa was silent and a sad look came over his face. He hugged me and said, I should remember that there are many blacks who are good people and never to judge someone by the color of his skin. Well, did Grandpa stop saying that word? No, I stopped judging people by the color of their skin, she said. But sometimes I still have trouble not being afraid of people who are different from me. Carol took her son's hand in hers. He studied the contrast between her creamy white hand and his light brown one. Mom, are you afraid of me? Carol hugged her son tightly. No, honey, I love you very, very much. 
but I'm afraid of what might happen to you and to the world if people don't stop hating each other for being different. Reaching over, Thomas grabbed the markers and pad. He carefully removed the page with her drawing from the pad and began making a series of arches, each a different color on a fresh page. When he was finished, he pushed his picture across the table to Carol. What's this, Mom? A rainbow, she said. No. Those are the colors of hope and love. Carol looked into her son's big brown eyes. Why is that? Well, when people see a rainbow, it gives them hope that the rain is going to stop and the sun is going to shine again. And that makes people happy. Oh, I see, she nodded. But her young son had more to teach her. It takes the six other colors to get the violet are in the center of the rainbow. All the different colors are beautiful, but they all have to come together in the middle to make a rainbow, and that takes love. Smiling, Carol picked up Thomas's rainbow and laid it on top of her drawing. You're right, Thomas, and rainbows always come after a storm. Wow, what a beautiful story. Yep, kids, they're so innocent and so perfect, and um, they see life lots of times the way it should be. What a beautiful story. I thank our author for that today. The next story that I want to share with you is um, called The Party by Dorian Weber. And it's a story about dreams and premonitions. And this mother had a dream, or a nightmare you might say, that uh, came to fruition. And um, it gives us food for thought to uh, pay attention to uh, our dreams and be aware of what's going on around us. I had tossed and turned most of the night in a restless sleep. I slowly opened my eyes and yawned as I looked out my bedroom window. It would soon be sunrise, with only a couple of hours of sleep. I didn't know how I was going to get through my hectic day. It was my daughter's third birthday, and I had so much to do before the guest arrived for her party. I wanted everything to be perfect. It was only 5 a.m. I needed more sleep, so I closed my eyes and managed to drift off again, but then I had the most vivid dream. Heather's birthday party was about to begin, and I was rushing around, tidying up the house and preparing food for my guest. Mom, when is everybody coming over? Mom, can I have just one more treat? My daughter kept interrupting me with questions. Feeling overwhelmed, I turned to her and said in a stern tone, Heather, enough. I have a lot to do. Go and ask your dad. With a sad face, my daughter went off to find her father. I called out to my husband, Harold, to tell him I was making a quick run to the grocery store for some last-minute items I had forgotten. I could feel the stress as I rushed out the door. Just then I heard a loud crash coming from inside my house. My daughter's cries were loud and terrifying. I tried to run to see what had happened, by leg- but my legs, they wouldn't move. M- my body was weighed down and I was stuck. I stood frozen in fear. I couldn't reach my daughter to help her. I woke up startled and confused and with my heart racing. The dream was so realistic. I thought it actually had happened. I looked at the clock and realized I had only been asleep for about a half hour. It was useless to try to fall back to sleep. I decided to begin my day and get ahead of start preparing for the party. I decorated the house with balloons and streamers, and I made over a dozen goodie bags that were filled with candy and small toys for the kids to take home. I finished making platters of finger foods, and I was very proud of Heather's rainbow bright birthday cake that I'd made. The morning whizzed by, and soon it was the afternoon. Guests would be arriving in less than an hour. There, I said with satisfaction as I put the finishing touches on the cake. Now I just need to go to the grocery store to buy the birthday candles I'd forgotten to purchase the day before. In a mad dash to beat the clock, I called out to Harold to let him know I'd be right back. As I headed out the door, I froze. This was just like my dream. This time I didn't freeze. I ran back inside the house just as my daughter was leaning on the glass dining room table to reach her drink. Everything after that went in slow motion. As I saw her crash through the glass tabletop, I was able to grab the back of her dress and lift her up before she hit the floor. 
As my daughter wailed, I searched her body to see if she was hurt. She was startled, but she didn't have a single scratch. My husband stood there in shock. The thick glass had caved in on the chrome base of the table, with huge sharp pieces of glass and shards everywhere. One large wedge of glass had been so close to my daughter's face, I shuddered to think what could have happened if I hadn't come back into the house, and if I didn't have that dream. My daughter was shaken up afterward, but I, I've learned that kids are more resilient than adults. A few minutes later, she asked for her drink, as if nothing had ever happened. As a mom, that was a relief. After Harold and I cleaned up the glass, we had a few minutes to spare before the guests arrived. We sat down to compose ourselves. The birthday party went off without a hitch. It was a wonderful diversion from what had just happened earlier. That night, in the quiet of our home, I reluctantly told Harold about my vivid dream. I thought he wouldn't take me seriously, but he looked me straight in the eye and said, Your dream saved Heather from getting badly hurt. What a great birthday gift you gave her. I smiled up at him with heavy eyes as I drifted off into a much-needed sweet slumber. So, my friends, pay attention to your dreams. God's angels often speak directly to our hearts. Here's another story that I thought you might all enjoy um, that was recently sent in to me by a friend. And the author is unknown, but I think you'll enjoy this. A man and his dog were walking along a road. The man was enjoying the scenery when it suddenly occurred to him that he was dead. He remembered dying and that the dog walking beside him had been dead for years. He wondered where the road was leading them. After a while, they came to a high white stone wall along one side of the road. It looked like fine marble. At the top of a long hill, it was broken by a tall arch that glowed in the sunlight. When he was standing before it, he saw a magnificent gate in the arch that looked like mother of pearl, and the street that led to the gate looked like pure, pure gold. He and the dog walked toward the gate, and as he got closer, he saw a man at a desk to one side. When he was close enough, he called out, Excuse me, sir, excuse me, where are we? This is heaven, sir, the man answered. Would you happen to have some water, the man asked. Of course, sir, come on right on in, and I'll have some nice ice water brought up right now. The man gestured, and the gate began to open. Can my friend, gesturing towards the dog, can he come in too, the traveler asked. Oh, no, I'm sorry, sir, but we don't accept pets. The man thought for a moment and then turned back toward the road and continued the way he had been going with his dog. After another long walk at the top of another lawn hill, he came to a dirt road leading through a farm gate that looked as if it had never been closed. There was no fence. As he approached the gate, he saw a man inside leaning against a tree and he was reading a book. Um, excuse me, sir, he called to the man. Do you have any water? Yeah, sure. There's a pump over there. Come on in. How about my friend here? The traveler gestured to the dog. Yeah, there should be a bowl by the pump. They went through the gate, and sure enough, there was an old-fashioned hand pump with a bowl beside it. The traveler filled the water bowl and took a long drink himself. Then he gave some to the dog. When they were full, he and the dog walked back toward the man, who was standing by the tree. Um, what do you call this place? the traveler asked. This is heaven, he answered. Well, that's confusing, the traveler said. The man down the road said that was heaven, too. Oh, you mean the place with the gold street and pearly gates? Nope, that's hell. Doesn't it make you mad for them to use your name like that? Oh, no. We're just happy that the, they screen out the folks who would leave their best friends behind. I thought you animal lovers would like that story. That was really neat. Thanks for sending that in, my friend. Well, I've got one more story for you today before I close. And this is our uplifting kind of silly story. 
and it's called A Miracle at Split Rock. And our author of this story, and it's pretty cute, uh, is Lynn Daroth Fusaner. And it's a story about laughing at ourselves. Well, and it says, never be afraid to laugh at yourself after all. You could be missing out on the joke of the century. That was said by Barry Humphreys. Several years ago, when the red hat craze was at its height, 685 red hatters converged on Split Rock Resort in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania for an annual regional red hat runaway. My best friend Peggy and I were the only ones in attendance from our chapter, the Red Hat Rascals. In the lobby, glittery boa feathered woman pressed even tighter against rows of registration tables. The sponsoring chapter of the Bordex Chapeau were overwhelmed with a crush of red and purple womanhood. We need a volunteer, shouted one of the harried Bordex ladies. Help! I can help, I thought. I worked registration dozens of times before I went up before I retired. Me, I cried out, waving frantically from the back of the crowd. I'm experienced in registration. I'll help. I'll help too, added my friend Peggy. Hurry. Can you get through? Came the fastest job offer following the shortest job interview in history. While Peggy and I squeezed through the crowd, careful to step over the assortment of luggage, handbags, handboxes, and totes. Peggy was directed to another section of the lobby, and I was placed behind the G to K registration place card. As I welcomed each weekend celebrant, I checked her name off my master G to K list and issued her a complimentary runaway tote, bag, and name badge. Throughout the afternoon, I welcomed, smiled, checked, and handed out, and I loved every second of it. Once the crowd was processed and the stream of registrants slowed to a trickle, the Grateful Bordex Chapeau woman expressed their gratitude. I was thanked, hugged, and kissed, and asked if I could come to the ballroom an hour before dinner to help set out favors, balloons, and centerpieces. How thrilling, I thought. I'm not only attending the runaway, but I'm helping. Sure, I said. Flushed with excitement over the registration experience, I reunited with Peggy, who had received, numbered, and arranged um, the huge influx of donated gift baskets that would be raffled off for the weekend. Peggy and I bubbled over with stories to share about our morning's volunteer experiences. We were both psyched to be invited to help out prior to the dinner. I noticed a crush of women in and around the bar area, each with a colorful cocktail in hand. Hey, let's go to the bar, I suggested. Whoa, said Peggy, you don't drink. I know, but I, I'm so revved up, I insisted. I think a drink is just what I need to help me relax. But you can't handle liquor. You never drink. I insisted using the logic that since I wouldn't have to drive, one little drink couldn't possibly do any harm. My dear friend just shrugged and gave me a, we'll see about that, look. I ordered a Kahlua and cream a drink that does not taste boozy to me. In fact, that afternoon, the mocha liquor tasted so refreshing, so cool, and so delicious that I chucked it down like it was chocolate milk. Peggy was horrified. Still thirsty, I wanted to order a second drink, but Peggy reminded me that we both had promised to help set up the purple pajama party dinner. Time was short, and there was barely time to shower and dress. I can handle another drink, I thought. The first one didn't really affect me, and the least, it didn't bother me at all. Peggy persisted. I relented. I dropped a tip on the bar, stepped off the bar stool, and the room began to spin. I grabbed Peggy's arm as she shot me and I told you so, look. With patience born of deep friendship, she took my elbow and guided me to my room. She took the key from my fumbling fingers and kindly opened the door for me. Don't look so worried, I slurred. A house to shower, and I'll, I'll be on my old self again. Uh, Peggy gave an encouraging smile and promised to return in 45 minutes. Alone in my room, I laughed at myself. Drinking? Me? Just imagine. I hadn't had a drink in decades. Maybe 20 or 30 years ago. The severe dizziness had passed, but I, I still felt lightheaded as I began to... Uh, peel off my clothing. I made my way into the bathroom, stepped inside a steamy shower, and pulled the glass door closed. 
Ah, a nice sh shower is just what I need. As I lathered up, I noticed something was not quite right. I, I wasn't sure what it was, but everything seemed, well, brighter, lighter. I washed my arms. Things were getting whiter. The maroon tile design was fading. Oh, my. My sight is going. There's something wrong with my eyes. I'm losing my vision. By leg washing time, all I could see was a wall of pure white. I'm blind, I'm blind. What did I do to myself? I had one little drink and now, I, and now I'm blind. I was frightened, really seriously, genuinely frightened. Look what I did to myself, I'm blind. Sobs choked in my throat, tears ran down my cheeks. My hands flew up to cradle my ruined eyes. Glasses. I was still wearing my glasses. I wasn't blind. Miracles of miracles, my glasses had fogged up from the shower steam. I wasn't blind, just tipsy. And then the big picture hit me, and I convulsed with laughter. The one little drink had affected me so much so that I'd forgotten to take off my glasses before stepping into the shower. I was still laughing when Peggy returned. I, I couldn't wait to share the story with her. All week long, Peggy and I would break into laughter suddenly over the shower decade thing. Eventually, the story of my brush with alcohol made its way around the convention crowd. Well, strangers insisted I retell the story, complete with a dramatization of the fear, the sobbing, and final crescendo of understanding as my hands cradled the fogged up glasses. Everyone laughed, <laughs> especially me. It took out a, to be a funny experience, but I learned a good lesson. A really good lesson, too. Actually, I relearned an old lesson. I can't hold my alcohol. At the following year's Red Hat Runaway, I passed when everybody ordered drinks, and I had a marvelous time anyway. <laughs> so, see, folks, it's good to laugh at yourself every now and then. <laughs> that was a cute little story. I know those Red Hat ladies very well, and I know they have fun and just enjoy life so much, and... Uh, I hope that you're all doing well out there and that you're having a good month and uh, continue to do so and keep looking for those beautiful rainbows out there. And remember to try to be happy the best you can with the way things are right now and give it your best efforts and just love each other and look for the sunshine and the rainbows. And until next time, take care and may God bless. This is Natalie Silva with Life Treasures and Golden Moments.